property manager to be somebody we knew. Her dog came home without her. This is a case that rocked the community. An extensive search for a missing teenager. 18-year-old Amanda Stavik suddenly disappeared. I can't believe something like this could happen to such an innocent person. My name is Bill Olmo. I'm the sheriff of Whatcom County. I'm the third sheriff to take this case on. What everyone in this small community had hoped wouldn't happen did happen. I was a reporter for KOMO TV. It was a huge story. She would not have just gone off and gone someplace without telling me. Period. She would the thought of her mom never having an answer. If you did that to her daughter, I wouldn't wish this on even my worst enemy. It was on everybody's radar. The case is never closed. It was constantly being investigated. I remember turning on the TV and just seeing an arrest had been made. Tonight, investigators say they cracked the case. I saw a picture of Mandy. Oh my gosh, is this really what I think it is? Oh my God. It was stunning. How could this have happened after so long? The story of Mandy Stabick is the story of a young woman's disappearance from a tight-knit rural community. It's the story of a family devastated and a whole community devastated. It was a big deal. I was initially appointed sheriff in 2003. I went out and spoke with Mandy's mother, Mary, and told her that I was going to make every effort that we would solve this case. Mary Stabick is a very sweet woman, but she's a very tough woman. I remember the first time I went out to meet her, she was out splitting uh, wood in her front yard, and uh, she was in her 70s at that time. I don't think I ever believed, ever, that they would catch the guy. The Stabick family lived out in Acme, which is a little tiny town down Highway 9 in Rural Whatcom County. Whatcom County is the most northwest county in Washington State. It is quite beautiful. This is about 15 miles east of Bellingham. Bellingham is the largest city in the county. It's um, rural, so it's um, not a lot out there. You know, open roads and um, lots of cows. We have very little crime out in that area, so. It was a place where people don't lock their doors and the car keys and the ignition. It's a very tranquil and very nice uh, community. My memory of their house is that it's set back from the road quite a bit. It was like ideal. It was on a dead end street, a mile from the highway. It was quiet and peaceful. The lots were all between 10 and 25 acres. Absolutely the nicest neighbors anybody could ever have. You knew your neighbor, you talked to your neighbor. Everybody knew who was coming in, who was leaving. They probably set their clocks by, you know, there goes Mr. Jones or headed to work and you know, he should be coming back pretty soon. Land had been owned by families for generations. People could tell stories about what your grandma did to my grandma years and years and years ago. When you live in a small town, you don't know everybody, but you know somebody who knows everybody. You just have this feeling that bad things aren't going to happen because people know each other. And that, in most cases, is true. Everyone that lived down there, even today, knows about Mandy Stavick and what happened to her. Mandy had just graduated from high school. She was in her first year at Central Washington University. She came home for Thanksgiving break. Mandy left her home on the day after Thanksgiving in 1989. She wanted to get in a run. It was kind of in the late afternoon. She had a daily route that she used to jog uh, that took her down the road that her house was on, on Strand Road, uh, down to the Nooksack River and back. She went with their dog, Kyra, a German Shepherd dog. It was an older dog, but it was, uh, it was very protective of Mandy. I normally went with her. I rode my bike, she ran, and the dog pounded along after us. But uh, that last morning that she disappeared, I didn't go with her because my sister was there, and so 
I kick myself. The houses along the way, um, there can't be more than 10 to 12 houses. I mean, there's just not many people. She turned around and I was running back home when she was seen by a neighbor as well as her brother Lee. Lee, my son, he was at the Anderson's house, which is about halfway between my house and Highway 9, down the Strand Road. He was there visiting his friend Jeremy. He remembers seeing her jump by coming home. She was maybe a quarter mile um, from her home. Um, definitely should have been there before Lee had gotten, gotten home. And when she didn't show up, there was concern. When she didn't come back, when she should have come back, and then the dog came back without her, I was panicky. First person I called was her boyfriend. I was worried that man was missing, then I got worried. The dog came home alone after about two hours, and they suspected something terrible had happened to her. It was so unusual that people started looking immediately. As the minutes and hours pass, you can't you can't believe anything other than something bad has happened. And so they called the police. I called the sheriff and I called everybody else I could think of. And I had everybody I knew out searching for her. Any kind of missing person call is a 911 call. It requires immediate response. And a deputy will go out and talk to the reporting party. What I remember hearing from them is this is something we got to move on right away. It's not right. You can tell that this is not somebody who runs away from home. There's no history, there's no past reports. I think the anxiety increased and increased. In any investigation like this, you're not looking at, you know, boyfriends, anybody that they might have had trouble with. Fingerprints, everything. Questioned by uh, a couple of detectives. Mom called me, she said, Mandy's missing. And I just, it's like, this can't be happening to us again. I, I was panicked the minute she didn't get home on time. And then I was doubly panicked a few minutes later when the dog was there, and she wasn't. All the neighbors were out looking. They canvassed the whole area. The hope was that they'd find her alive. We just prayed that they would find her alive. You think to yourself, God, maybe she's just hurt. She can't get home. So you've got one person getting information as far as clothing, um, picture what they look like, while you have other um, deputies out there searching the roadway from her running route. She was wearing a light colored sweatshirt, teal green sweatpants, light blue running shoes with a purple stripe, and she had a Walkman. She was listening to music as she ran. In any investigation like this, you'd have to figure out who Mandy was, what she was about. She was very everything. I don't know what other words to describe her. One of my favorite Mandy stories, in the summertime, in order to keep my seven and a half acres of pasture eaten down, I would borrow some cows from a neighbor I had. One summer he brought over just four and he said, well, these are bulls. <laughs> and one day when Mandy was about two years old, she was short enough so that she could run under our fence without hitting the hot wire. She went out to play with the bulls and I was scared to death. I mean, those bulls weighed probably 2,000 pounds a piece, and they were huge, and here she is. They froze. Those bulls absolutely froze. She could have gone right up to them if I hadn't caught her first. She was not afraid to do anything that she set out to do. Mandy Stavik was a bright, vivacious, gregarious, 18-year-old, graduated from Mount Baker High School, was in her very first semester at Central Washington University. We 
Candy loved anything athletic. She could do things that I could never do. Um, she could jump on a horse bareback and take off running across the field. She loved softball. She loved track. She loved baseball. Um, she loved basketball. She played everything she could. I said to her, you can't turn out for track and play basketball at the same time. And she says, you want to bet? <laughs> Never bet with Mandy. She always wins. In 89, I was the band director at Mount Baker. Mandy wanted to be the best at whatever she was doing. We spent a lot of time going for walks and things and just talking and, you know, we talked about relationships and just different things and things that you would talk about, you know, as young teenage girls. What I loved about her, she's independent. I met Mandy when I was a sophomore and maybe she was a freshman. I was a year ahead of her. First big love, of course, and for some reason, she loved me. I think she was way out of my league, but, you know. <laughs> Everybody liked her, so she wasn't the typical student that, you know, may have one or two enemies. Live from Seattle, this is Google News 4. Good evening, I'm Kathy Goethe. And I'm Dan Lewis. An extensive search for a missing teenager. Her brother, who was visiting a neighbor, actually saw her run one direction and then a few minutes later run the other way. He was the last person to see her. Every TV station, radio station, newspaper from across the state and even outside the state national media were covering it. I was in my first year as a reporter at the Bellingham Herald um, at the time. I uh, hopped in my car and I drove out and uh, interviewed Mary. She understood that there was a chance that we could help. And then we called everybody, all the neighbors and all of her friends, just to see if anybody had seen her. Mandy's mother is a school bus driver for the Mount Baker District. She's a survivor uh, with, with everything that she's gone through. Mandy's family had come from Alaska. Her parents were divorced. Mary had come down uh, with three kids, uh, Mandy and Molly and Lee, and settled in Acme. Mom called me, she said, Mandy's missing. And I just, it's like, this can't be happening to us again. She had had an older brother who was killed in Alaska years before. My oldest son's name was Brent. We lived very close to Fort Richardson in Anchorage. And he had permission from them to hunt on base. And one day somebody shot him. They called me and said they had his body. He had 1722 shells in his back. There was a lot of investigating. It was basically an unsolved murder. I still don't know who it was. She said, I thought I had lived through the worst thing that could happen when Brent died. It's like Molly said, this can't be happening to our family again. I think I said to her something like, oh, of course it can't happen. We're going to find her and it'll be okay. Even though I didn't really believe that. But I just wanted to give her hope. Rick Zender was Mandy Stavik's boyfriend, and as is typical in murder investigations, they wanted to question him. We dated for about three years. We've probably broken up two or three times. It's just one of those, I say, high school things. At that point, her relationship was on and off, on and off, but he had brought her home from college. They checked to see where her, her ex-boyfriend was. Oh, I want to be viewed as a suspect. I mean, that's what they should do. That's her job. Usually it's the person closest to it's the killer. They spoke to him. Uh, he was extremely forthcoming. He came in, gave a statement. The authorities ultimately cleared Rick Zender, but of course they had to look at him. The first night didn't hear anything. So by the second day, it was pretty obvious that this was even more serious than we originally thought. It was such a mystery. I mean, beautiful 18-year-old, smart, strong women don't just vanish. They don't do that. 
were checking a lot of side roads and found something I thought was a little bit suspicious. The first thing I did was take a video. When they found the sweatpants, it was, maybe this is something, you know, this is a clue. effort to find Mandy was really extensive. The whole town practically was combing everywhere, looking for clues, hoping to find her alive. They've called out the Border Patrol helicopter and the Sheriff's Posse. We're going to get into some of the areas that you uh, are going to be able to drag in with the Corbin Grande. An exhaustive search goes into its second day since 18-year-old Amanda Stave suddenly disappeared yesterday afternoon. I've had every kind of mode of transportation to search from you know, riding uh, motorcycles, uh, jeeps, uh, going door to door, walking the ditches, uh, bringing in bloodhounds. They had patrols going through fields that were adjacent to her house. Uh, we had uh, specifically trained uh, people that are called man trackers. My name is Joel Harden. I was the Border Patrol's expert tracker for 20 years. The biggest conception about when someone says tracker is someone is down on their hands and knees looking for shoe impressions, a footfall, they call it. Um, it's so much more than that. I see in the surroundings, in the ground cover and so on, that which other people see but are not conscious of. I took several classes and the instructor would say, look at this leaf. Turn it over. See this mark? That's a bruise. That's probably four to five hours old. When a branch on a live uh, bush is broken, it bleeds and it scars. And by looking at that, you can pretty well predict when it was broken. Expert trackers use the term sign to indicate any discoverable evidence that could be linked to the missing person. I went to the house and talked to the family and learned what Mandy's normal route was and followed the sign and found the evidence that it was her sign that was coming out onto that road. It was her tracks and followed it to a place where the tracks just stopped and it shouldn't have. Her dog was running with her and the dog tracks stopped there also. It makes you think probably someone pulled her into a car and took off with her. I mean, that's kind of the worst. She's not going to be forcibly uh, taken forcibly unless two or three guys grabbed her and there was no no evidence of that on the road there was no scuffling and pushing and shoving and that type of thing the question was was it just somebody driving by that drove up that road and sees this beautiful girl running with a dog and decides to grab her or was it somebody that knew her Man tracker went to the Stavik home, talked to Mary Stavik, to Mandy's mother, and the dog had come home alone. The dog was on the porch. It was a German Shepherd. She was upset. She didn't know what to do with herself. I said, "Where's Mandy? Where's Mandy, Kyra? What did you do? Where is she?" Our man tracker trying to get the dog to come down, thinking the dog would lead him to where she had last been. The dog would come off the porch, and the dog cowered. He thought something by looking at the dog had happened to the dog. We believe that the dog was kicked or hit or something to um, control the dog. Um, we actually believe maybe even kicked into the ditch where it couldn't fight back or protect Mandy. Enough people along Strand Road had seen her uh, heading out and then coming back that they knew pretty close um, to the time that she had disappeared. Her brother had seen her, uh, some neighbors had seen her. Call the neighborhood canvas where we'd go out door to door, find neighbors that had seen her, and then kind of leapfrog from there. You get numb. You just you just get focused on searching for her and hoping and that uh, you'll go find her. Somebody will discover something. On Sunday, two days after she disappeared, uh, Spade County Search and Rescue Team were checking a lot of side roads and pull-offs, anything. And they found something they thought was a little bit suspicious and wanted us to look at it. The first thing I did was take a video of the entire area. The only opening in the foliage here has been made by the lane. The situation was a overgrown 
road and everything on that road looked old, wet. I've been there for a long time. Over to the left of this area, on top of some other debris, appear to be an article of clothing, a pair of green sweatpants. Mandy was wearing green sweatpants. Mandy's mother, Mary, was brought to the scene and shown those pants. I didn't remember exactly what she was wearing, but I didn't think they could have been. For one thing, they were dirty and they had ripped holes in them. And Mandy wouldn't have worn, ever worn anything like that. Mary said at the time that she didn't think that they were hers. But she also said that she didn't want to think that they were hers. They were eventually sent to the laboratory uh, for analysis, look for trace evidence, um, look for anything that might be related to our missing person. There were some tiny fibers, and there were also some semen stains that were analyzed and not connected to Mandy or anybody else in the case. I don't know, I feel so bad for her mother. I just feel so bad for her family. Strand Road, where Mandy Stavik was believed to have been kidnapped so close to her family home, is empty today. People were absolutely shocked that this could happen in a community like Acme that changed everything. I would think of Seattle. New York, a bigger city, not even Bellingham. I didn't even think this would really happen in Bellingham. They didn't know who this person was. Does he live in our community? People were scared to go jogging. It could have been anyone, and everywhere we went could have been the person that did this to Mandy. Everywhere I looked, there was danger. We had a vessel searching the river by boat. One of the searchers called out that he had seen something. That image is etched in my brain like granite. And the search went on for three days. She was found on the third day. We had a vessel from one of the neighboring fire districts uh, searching the river by boat. They went upstream and they were just slow drifting the river and check in little areas that couldn't be seen from shore. And one of the searchers called out that he had seen something and so then they powered back up. And there she was. Mandy was found on the south fork of the Nipsack River, probably close to five and a half, six miles from her house. There was a bend in the river and some debris and the body was just hung up in the debris there. We're in a location on the east side of the river. She has not been disturbed since the discovery. I saw her body. She was face down. She was just kind of suspended, just a little bit off the bottom. There was a branch there that was some debris that prevented her from floating any further downstream. She was naked, except for shoes and socks on. The tennis shoes That's the description. We could never find her clothing. She had a Walkman that was gone. There were no obvious signs of any trauma. There were scratch marks on her thighs or legs and the arms that seemed to be indicative of that running through blackberry bushes, which are quite prevalent in that part of the county. Where she was, was about knee deep, maybe a little bit deeper. And the only way to get in there and turn her over and preserve that evidence was just simply that, get in the water with her. And that's what I did. The temperature of the water that preserved her body well it looked like you could just shake her and she would have woke up. It looked like she was sleeping. I've seen a lot. Vietnam vet, I saw a lot of stuff there. I saw a lot of stuff in my career in law enforcement. It's never easy. None of it is. But this was extraordinary because it was a young college girl, the all-American girl in our community. And for me, when I looked down, I didn't see Mandy. I saw my dog. Same physical characteristics, same age. That's why it's stuck. That image is etched in my brain like granite. The detective that was with me dispatched himself uh, in a quick fashion to get to the family home to let her know we had found her. I knew. I knew she was gone. I don't know why. I think mothers know. I've talked to other mothers. She said we felt the same thing. I knew she was dead. 
I didn't want to say it even to myself, but I knew. Mary told me. I remember I was upstairs. There's a window you could like see outside with the sheriff coming up, talking to Mary, and then I knew what was happening. She came up the stairs and told me they found her body in the river. This afternoon, searchers found a body in Whatcom County. A body has been recovered from the south fork of the Nooksack River. The body of Amanda Stavik, whom everyone knew as Mandy, was found today. I wouldn't wish this on even my worst enemy. There's nothing, there's nothing worse. There's nothing worse than lo losing a child. And I already knew that. Nobody should have to lose two children at the time that that they were bringing her body out of the river, but our photographer went down and um, and took pictures of several people carrying the body bag up the bank from the river. And it's a beautiful photograph in the respect that it kind of looks like pallbearers. I didn't want to find a, I didn't want to find a body. I remember running out of the house. I ran off into the field and just remember screaming. You know, screaming at life, at God, you know, how did something like that happen? How could he let something like that happen? How did she drown? How did she end up in the river? How did she end up in the state that she was found when her body was found? What happened? What happened between the last time her brother saw her running on the road to, to finding her in the river? The autopsy was the next day, and the medical center indicated the cause of death was drowning. Asphyxia by drowning. My biggest question was, how did she drown? Mandy was a strong swimmer. She was a lifeguard. And it wasn't that deep, so she'd gone in and was conscious or in control of her body. She could have stood up where she was and gotten out. She must not have been conscious. She must not have been aware, because there was no signs of struggle. There was no, you know, like her digging in the gravel or something like that. It was nothing. She was very peaceful. She had an injury on the very top part of her head. Uh, that was a hematoma. That was a, a bleeding under the scalp. It was a, uh, an area of about three inches by two inches. Because her hair was so thick, you couldn't see it. The medical examiner believed that it would have been not enough to kill her, but uh, could have knocked her out. In my line of work, the evidence field, you're always hoping for that pristine scene when nothing has been disturbed. But in this case, the water was a washing agent. So the only thing that's left is her fingernails, if she fought. And the other thing would be a evidence of a sexual assault. The medical examiner determined that she was uh, sexually assaulted. My immediate concern was DNA. DNA technology as a science for solving crimes was in its infancy. In the 80s, it wasn't a typical type of crime scene evidence that was collected or even thought about necessarily. Fortunately, the investigators back then were acutely aware of DNA. Ron Peterson had just returned from Quantico, where the FBI Academy has. He knew that, hey, there's this thing called DNA. It's relatively new. In 1989, the only people that were doing DNA testing in the criminal world were officers submitting their samples to the FBI. They were the only scientists that were trained and equipped to work with this technology. They took DNA evidence from Mandy's body. They created a DNA profile of both Mandy and an unknown male. The FBI did what they could at the time, which was obtain a DNA profile, but they didn't have anybody to compare it to. The one question that the sheriff's office wanted answered is who left the DNA? They believed that whoever left it was responsible for Mandy's death. And finding a match for DNA is like finding the right star in the sky. It's either there or it's not there. Tips were coming in faster than the department could handle. We ran every single one of them down. They found another victim of this country's worst known serial killer. The Green River Killer was a big story. He was in Seattle. Nine more women are missing and presumed dead. It's a series of unsolved crimes. Could this be the work of the Green River Killer? Could this be another serial killer in the area? I hope they catch the people that did this to her. 
I pray for the mother every night. I just seem so so terrible. Why don't I can't see what I can happen? In these tough times when there's nothing to do, you can't do anything. You know, you want to do something, but now he's dead. You can't do anything about that. So what do you do? They had the memorial service in our school auditorium. No church within miles is large enough for all the people, more than 1,000 of them, who want to say goodbye to Mandy Stavik. Well, you couldn't believe how many people were there. Today we come together to share the deep sorrow that has ripped our hearts. I think it was like standing room only. A classmate of mine, Pete Stewart, and I wrote a Mandy song for her memorial. The words that we wrote were true then and they're still true now. I can't believe evil's taken innocence away. Evil did take Mandy's innocence away, but I also feel like it took away the innocence of our community. All the newspapers and TV stations were there, and then they had a, a little graveside service at the burial. That was very private. She's buried in the cemetery right up the street from my house. There was a photo of Rick Zender He's standing at the grave site holding a teddy bear. It's the teddy bear I got her, which is kind of so silly, but she, you know, she loved that bear and then went ahead to go back to college and pack her stuff up. And then one of the things was this teddy bear still smelled like her. But it faded. Once there was a criminal investigation launched, then the police were very careful about what information they gave us. They only wanted to release the information that could generate more leads. The sense was, who could have done this? This isn't something that a community member would have been involved in. We found another victim of this country's worst known serial killer. The Green River Killer was a national story. He made headlines across the country. Nobody knew who was behind all these disappearances. Nine more women are missing and presumed dead. It's a series of unsolved crimes, serial killer, and he was in the Green River area. He was in Seattle. It was just a huge number of victims there. He would go out and look for women, and he would kill them, and then bury them in the area of the Green River. All the victims appear to be white females, ranging in age from their late teens to mid-30s. Could Mandy have been one of the Green River Killer's victims? Her age was right, her looks were right. It was like, oh, the Green River Killer, come up here. It would be easy to make that leap of, could this be another serial killer in the area? Certainly the officers talked about that, and they thought about that. There was a giant task force in our investigators when Mandy happened, and, and we were coming up short. Uh, with nothing solid we could go on. They took all the documentation and went and met with the Green River Task Force. And they, they pretty much said to them, do we fit? And it didn't match the profiles of what they were working with. Mary continued to put herself out in the public eye. Please welcome Mary Stavick. <laughs> to keep interest in the case so that there would be a better chance of finding the person who did it. It was important for Mary and for us to make sure that her story was still out there because we didn't have any answers. We didn't have any leads. Why come here? Why talk about it again? Well, I guess because I'm hoping that somebody who's out there listening will remember something that will help the, the uh, law enforcement people find the person who killed my daughter. The tip line was set up after Mandy was found. Crime stoppers will pay up to $1,000 for information that leads to an arrest and charge. The tips were coming in faster than the, the department could handle. They were numerous, I mean, daily, hundreds of tips, and we ran every single one of them down. It was massive. They had an FBI profile that projected it would be someone in the community. Paul Malik was an early person of interest for several reasons. First of all, he was a neighbor of the Stavics. He lived very close by. Also, he was one of the last people to see Mandy alive. He indicated to law enforcement that he had seen Mandy and he had seen a car drive by. As he was backing out of his driveway, he saw Mandy jogging by. He also said that he saw a dark pickup truck, but he couldn't give any details, like what make was it, what model was it, who exactly was driving it. He tended to maybe act like he was inserting himself into the investigation, which is sometimes a red flag for investigators. Are they looking for information? 
interested in fishing or are they trying to help you solve this? You know, what's, what's their motivation? He was interviewed several times by our agency. They asked him to do a DNA sample, which he initially refused. So they went and got a court order and forced him to do it. I worked with the detectives. We got a search warrant for his blood. We excluded him. Time and time again, they would have a person of interest. They would question that person, but something would rule them out. They had a good alibi, or ultimately, their DNA did not match. This case dragged on. It becomes a cold case, but after, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, it's like, well, it's never going to be solved. When a new detective would come in, they would bring different eyes to it. New people are going to look at different things. You have one person that can answer some questions because they're the ones that own that DNA. We thought this would be the key, that this would solve this case. Well, maybe it was a neighbor, maybe it was a friend, and from that, the sweep was born. We decided to go out and try to interview and collect DNA from as many of the males that we knew that lived in that area we weren't going to give up until it was solved. That it would happen like this, I never would have guessed. I saw breaking news and I saw a picture of Mandy. Oh my gosh, is this really what I think it is? It was stunning. How could this have happened after so long? It was so out of the realm of anything we could ever have expected. I couldn't possibly imagine it would be somebody we knew. From a hunch or a gut feeling to solving a case that is 30 years old. I don't know what I had in my hand, but I dropped it. I never expected it to be him. I never suspected him. It was just like, you gotta be kidding me. search goes into its second day since 18 year old Amanda Savick suddenly disappeared. The story is about the life and death of a girl who was unexpectedly taken. Ask anybody around Acme they'll tell you Mandy was a wonderful young woman. This was an abduction. This was an area that should be safe and it was a very big concern. It was a huge thing in our community and even 30 years later it's a huge thing. She was the all-American girl. She's great in sports. Everybody knows her, friendly with everyone. It was just a great story. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's over. It's ended. It just wasn't right. Mandy was in her first year of college when she came home for Thanksgiving, when she disappeared. I was like, oh my god. And this light went off in my head. And I thought, well, I think I have figured out who killed Mandy Savick. It was stunning. How could this have happened after so long? Mandy went on a jog, the same road that her house was on, down Strand Road. She took her German Shepherd. A few hours later, her dog came home without her. Three days later, she was found in the river. It was definitely one of the biggest cases in the history of the sheriff's office. A lot of cases that we investigate, a lot of tasks that are done, but this one stuck with all of us, and it never went away. Everybody looked at it as Mandy was our daughter. That, that definitely kept things going. Initially, there was hope that it would be, there would be some resolution, that, that the case would be solved, that we would know what happened. But that seemed to continue to just drag on. After a couple of decades, I just thought they'd never find the killer. I just somehow make peace with it, just never be resolved. And never had that silly closure word, you know. When a new detective was assigned to the detective division, one of the first tasks they were assigned was to take the static volumes, many of them, three inches thick, and read the case cover to cover. New set of eyes. Did you see anything? What did we miss? What could we have done differently? The case had. 2009 was 20 years old. I said, let's try something new. I assigned the Detective Bowie to the case. There was about 20 years of investigation. Um, at that point, the, there was probably three, maybe 4,000 pages of reports. At the time of Mandy's disappearance, he was a, a new deputy, and he was actually involved in searching the scene. One of my motivators is I went to Mount Baker High School. We all knew the case. We all knew how serious it was, how devastating, how it impacted not only our lives personally, but as well as the community, Wacom and 
Acme area are, are so tight. Something happens to one family, it happens to all of us. Every few years, there'd be a story in the newspaper. They'd interview the police, and every time they would say, this isn't a cold case, we're, we're, we're still at this. And then, as you hear about DNA, is, you, know, you start wondering about that. You think, maybe DNA will make a difference. Detective Kevin Bowie was the third detective with the sheriff's office to be the lead in trying to find Mandy's killer. And he came up with this idea to do a systematic DNA sweep of people who lived in the Acme area. One of my co-workers had read a book called The Blood Demon. The Blood case was a very similar case to a man stabbing in England. The body of 15-year-old Dawn Ashworth was discovered in the undergrowth last Saturday. There was a case in which a young woman was abducted and raped and killed. And they had a sample from her and they, it had just developed DNA as a, an investigative analysis tool, a forensic tool. British authorities had this really novel idea to go ahead and test every man that was in a certain age range in a certain geographical area. There is still plenty of inquiry to be done, and they will be carried on until they're all completed. We went door to door. They got all kinds of samples. More than 5,000 people. They tested their DNA, and eventually they found the killer. The DNA sweep was the strategy that they used, and we thought that would work great with our situation. We tried everything else, let's try this. And that's kind of the way law enforcement is. When thing doesn't work, try something else. You never just stop. I'm Catherine Woodard. I work at the Washington State Patrol Crime Laboratory in the DNA section. I was informed that they had reached a point in the investigation where they thought it most helpful to do what's called a DNA sweep. The process was to find out back in 89 who lived where and how old they were, and then that would establish a list of who we needed to locate and request a sample of their DNA. Basically, you just go to their house, ask for a cheek swab, and test it against the profile that was taken from Mandy's body. We had a list of a couple hundred suspects. We wanted their DNA to either eliminate them or to look at them further. One of the things that I don't like was that if they ever caught the guy, I was going to have to live through the whole damn thing again. And with that in the back of my head, I just didn't care. What good does it do? It doesn't bring it back. It's just a matter of time. We're going to ask the right person. We're going to get the right sample of DNA. We just got to keep plugging away. Tim Bass came up as a suspect. He was a loner. He was quiet. He was just a little bit of an oddball. We realized, of course, he had been living right on that road and had not really been contacted. He was very controlling and always told me what to do, who I could talk to, who I couldn't talk to. She had said that she didn't feel safe and that Tim would write that if he committed a murder, he would be caught. He was the same guy who lived on the same road as Mandy Stabbing, who was bragging that if he committed murder, he could get away with it. as many folks as we could, asked for samples, tried to find out what they might have known or what they might have heard over the last 30 years. It's the longest case I've worked on without having an investigative lead DNA-wise. At one point, we sent 31 samples at one time. She sorted through all of them. I wouldn't say you lose hope after comparing that many samples, but you can't be as excited each time when you get let down that many times. To me, it was, if you haven't got anything to hide, then there's there's no problem giving your DNA, and I had no problems asking. The case had never, never left the thoughts of Mandy's friends. And so two women were talking about the case and talking about what a, a strange person Tim Bass was. And they decided we should talk to the sheriff's office. They should look at him. She just told me she'd always had a gut feeling that Tim Bass was the person responsible for Manny Stabbing's death. He lived in the area, so his name was on the list, but he got moved, I guess, to the head of the list. In 1989, Tim Bass lived on one side of Highway 9 on Strand Road, and Mandy Stabbing lived on the other. There's only a few houses between his and Mandy's, and Mandy used to jog or run past his house nearly every day. We realized, of course, he had been living right on that 
road and have not really been contacted. His family knew their family. I mean, everyone is connected. Mass went to Mount Baker High School, was a 1986 graduate. Although Mandy may not have known Tim Bass very well, she was familiar with his younger brother, Tom Bass. They were friends. They ran in the same circles. Tim Bass, we didn't hang out with him. He was just, to me, he's Tom Bass's older brother. He's just a guy in the background. He was a loner. He was a loner. He was quiet. My impression is kind of, he was just a little bit of an odd. He lived with his mom, uh, dad, and brother at that time. He was kind of awkward. Tim moved out of the area shortly after the murder. It was in January of 1990. He had quickly gotten married and moved to Everson. I'm Gina Malone, and Tim Bass used to be my husband. I went to Mount Baker High School. I graduated in 1990. I didn't know Mandy, but I knew who she was. Like, we weren't friends or anything, but I would see her every day. I met Tim by working at my grandpa's uh, little grocery store, and he came in for a hunting license, and I was working that day, and he just said, you want to go out sometime? It was nice that someone asked me out and was interested. They were supposed to get married when she graduated from high school. After Mandy was killed, he married her it was a very sudden thing all of a sudden he comes to me and he's like do you want to get married now and so we got married they had three children together and he became a local delivery driver for the franz bakery outlet he was very controlling and always told me what to do what i could wear what i couldn't wear who i could talk to who i couldn't talk to he didn't even call me by my name he called me by poor bitch and i would tell him i'm like i don't like you calling me that and he's like oh whatever why can't you take why can't you laugh and take a joke whatever get mad he would like come towards me like this with his fist um he did shove me against the bathroom wall once and bruised my back 2010 gina had filed for a domestic violence protection order for herself and her three children. In the order, she had said that she didn't feel safe and that Tim would watch cold case TV files. When he would watch the cold case files or movies that pertain to murder, he would always say the murder was stupid and didn't cover his tracks very well and he wouldn't be stupid enough to get caught. That case was later closed because she rescinded the domestic violence order and they stayed married. I wanted to stay away. I just, I didn't want to go back. But I just always ended up back. <laughs> I thought Tim would give us our, his DNA or he wouldn't, but if you don't ask, you, you don't know. Um, went out there, his uh, wife, Gina, answered the door. She invited us in. She knew the Maddie Stavick case right away. When they said that they were there to collect the DNA that they had already collected from a lot of people in the area. She said that she was expecting Tim home um, within, a, within a few minutes. They asked him about Mandy Stavick, and he said, oh, and he looked up at the ceiling like he couldn't remember that name. That was definitely a red flag for me, which indicated to me that he's obviously lying. You don't grow up in that area. Everybody knew what the Maddie Stavick case was, and she ran past his house every day. How would you not know it? And he said, oh, was that, uh, was that the girl that was missing? And uh, he said, uh, they said, yes, it was. And uh, he said, oh, you know, I remember she was found in the river. Like it was sort of a revelation that he had brought that back to his mind. He knows exactly who Mandy Stavick was, but he was playing it off like he didn't. Tim said he wasn't going to give us the DNA, that he didn't trust the police, which was another red flag, and by then, we were out of flags. I just flat out came out and said, if you don't have anything to hide, why don't you give it? Straight, simple, done. I was always saying, well, they could frame me, they frame people all the time. I was just like, what am I living with? He shot to the top of the suspect list. It was kind of like, okay, what's plan B? We went to Franz, and that's where I met Kim Wagner. I hadn't told anybody, you know, I think I potentially have figured out who killed Mandy Savick. I knew this was the only way we were going to get the answers. And my heart was like, mm -hmm. you know, beating out of just, I grabbed it and I put it in my desk drawer. I'm thinking this is too good to be true.
two masses named have not come up before. An approach was made in 2013. We did not get a sample. Our local prosecutor, Dave McEachern, said that Tim's biggest fear is that someone would show up on his doorstep with a badge and ask what happened to Mandy. 2017, we decided to get a sample when you would have to do this surreptitiously. Detective Bowie approached where he worked. He was a delivery, group delivery person for Franz Brands. We went to Franz, and that's where I met Kim Wagner for the first time. I met Tim Bass when he came to work with me for a commercial bakery. Kim was from the area. She had grown up nearby, and she was delivering baked goods out in the Acme area when Mandy went missing. It impacted me. I was a 19-year-old kid. It was the first time something scary happened. I mean, it, it changed everyone's perspective on our little corner of the world. She said that it was the first time that she didn't feel safe at her home anymore. Could have been the person next door. We, we didn't know. But Tim was a little bit uh, full of himself, kind of, but also maybe a little bit insecure. I think that Tim's probably got more than one Tim inside him. After Tim Bass refused to give a voluntary sample for the second time, Detective Bowie reached out to Fran's bakery. Um, they came in, they said that there was an employee here on investigation for a case, and they would like to get route information and maybe collect a cigarette butt. Or, and they, at that point, I just I shut him down. I was like, yeah, no, this is not, this is way above my pay grade. Gave them our human resources information, and they said they were going to follow up. The Franz Bakery was not willing to initially cooperate with us, wanted a subpoena or a search warrant, and we didn't have sufficient probable cause to get a warrant. After that, I was in a bar with my husband. There was a group of people there, there was an acquaintance of Tim and I's there, and we started talking about different random people at work, and then we started talking about Tim, because he's a weirdo. <laughs> and that person had been reading something, and they were like, did you know that Tim Bass lived on the Strand Road? And I was like, well, yeah. And he goes, I didn't realize that Mandy Savick went missing from the Strand Road. And as he was talking, I was like, oh my God. And this light went off in my head, and I thought, is that why the police are in my work? So once I had that conversation in the bar, I kind of started paying more attention to Tim at work. Like, everybody wears the uniform. He would wear the uniform, but everyone else turns it in to get washed. He never did that. I noticed he didn't throw anything away. Like, his garbage can, his truck was always empty. And so I was like, huh, this is odd. I was very determined to get Tim Bass's DNA. The plan, it was to follow Tim around and see if he ate anything, threw anything away, if he was a smoker. We are looking for any sample of DNA from him. We went back to from the bakery. We were hoping that Kim would provide us with Tim's delivery route. Took him in my office, closed the door, and I was like, I gotta ask you a question. When you were here, were you investigating Mandy Savick's murder? And he just looked at me like, like a cartoon character, like that is popping out of their head. He just looked at me like, oh my God. And then I said, was it Tim Bass? There was definitely a look on my face because I was shocked. I get information, I don't give information. She, at that time, gave up Tim's route. She said, you know, he drives the Fairhaven route. This is the general time that he starts checking the area for a yellow truck. When we followed Tim that night, we found out he wore gloves. So even if we bought a loaf of bread that he's touched, it wasn't going to have any DNA on it. Um, we found that he wasn't a smoker. We found out that he didn't throw things away. Tim basically took his trash home. Detective Bowie called Kim to let her know that their surveillance of Tim was not successful. At that point, she says, well, I watch those CSI shows. You're looking for DNA, aren't you? So I said, you need a water bottle? I'll get you a water bottle. I'm kind of an instant gratification, like dog with a bone. I, I need to know. They said, we can't ask you to do it. You can't do this for us. We're not asking. We can't tell a person to get evidence for us. But if they were to bring something to us, we could take it from them and, and use that. That's not against the law. Nobody asked me to do it. I 100% volunteered to do it. The reason I wanted to know was I'm a mom now. 
if something happened to my daughter, I'd want someone to help me. And I, the thought of her mom never having an answer of who did that to her daughter, if I could help her find that peace, I wanted to do it. She watched Tim. They got a water cooler at their office and he drank out of a plastic cup and threw it away. And he threw it in the garbage in front of me, walked past into the bathroom. And I just, I looked in the garbage and my heart was like, mm -hmm, you know, beating out of my chest. And I grabbed it and I put it in my desk drawer. And I was like, oh my God, that just happened. I think I waited a little bit and then I texted Detective Bowie. I couldn't get it back to the office quick enough and down to the lab quick enough to have it tested. When the cup arrived, I performed a swabbing of the drinking area. I pulled up the old information to compare to, and let's just say I was more than surprised. I compared it over and over more than once, and my heart was pounding. She had left a message, and we're like, well, what would she be calling about? Even though we knew what she'd be calling about, and I was like, well, let's call her right now and put it on speakerphone. I sort of stumbled through my words, and as soon as I got the word match out, I heard it amount of cheering that was deafening. It was a one in 11 quadrillion, if you can imagine that number, match on Timothy Bass. 11 quadrillion has 15 zeros, quite a few. <laughs> you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in the court of law. Tim's demeanor was flat. He didn't show a lot of emotions. There's some cat and mouse between the detectives and Tim Bass. I don't remember giving Danny. And Danny changed his story. He completely does a 180 degree turn. I, I can't do this. No way. It's crazy, man. It's absurd. When Tim Bass was taken into custody at his workplace, he agreed to talk to us down at the station. So we transported him down to the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office into an interview room. He's like, you've seen on TV on those shows you've watched, I just have to advise you things before we talk to any further. So, um, you have the right to remain silent. Tim's demeanor was flat. He didn't show a lot of emotion. I acted, tried to act like, you know, a lot of disbelief, like, no, I didn't have anything to do with this. You've got the wrong person. I've never had any intimate relationship with her. I've never even kissed her. He's testing the waters to see whether or not they actually have his DNA versus them telling him a ruse. How, how did that come about? My DNA. Have you guys got my rap sample? I don't remember giving DNA. I'm sure in his mind he was thinking, I've gone through all these measures to make sure you guys didn't get my DNA. How did this happen? Where did I screw up? You just tell me. If you just did it sneak, you did right. something weird. Well, of course I did. Okay. Well, that's all you need to tell me. But the but. point being is, I, if I didn't have something of that right. nature, right. you wouldn't be sitting here. Right. I think once he realized I actually did have his DNA, then he switched. Well, I wanted to tell you a long time ago, but I just didn't trust you. I've been told not to say stuff. And, uh, I, I can't do this. I can't. Uh, I trust you guys. I can't. If this bites me in the ass, or if this is not what I'm supposed to do, then whatever. I don't, I don't give a um, I slept with her. He completely does a 180 degree turn and at that point says, Yes, I slept with her. Tim Bass told us a story that he was having a secret relationship with Mandy. How long did it go on? Uh, I met her. I think I was with my dad. We were mountain bike riding up and down the road. And he talked to her. He had a way with people. He just talked to her. And I talked to her. And then um, after that, I got the bike up and down the road. She jogged. So, and we talked and stuff. So. But uh, I think that was in the spring. So it wasn't that long a relationship because she went away and to college, I want to say. East, well, Eastern or Central? Central. Central. Did you have any correspondence with her? Do you have letters, or did you make phone calls to her? No, she used to say when she come back, she'd see me. His story had no depth. He didn't know what she was going to take in school. He didn't know what her she wanted to do as a profession or what her future held. He knew nothing. It was more of a friendship type thing. We just talked, and uh, then it just kind of grew into. 
more of a physical thing, and we didn't even really do it that much. So it was more kissing and stuff. He had never spoken to her on the phone. Uh, he hadn't written to her. And she shows up and without any prior warning, comes over for what was referred to in that interview as a booty call. And that's how we accounted for his DNA being found. We all kind of knew that that was BS. If Tim ever had a relationship with Mandy Stavick, he'd have told everybody he knew. He just shouted it from the rooftops. There's no way my sister would have had a relationship, a physical relationship with Tim Bass. She was way, way, way out of his league, <laughs> to put it bluntly. The only one that knew about it besides him was his dad, and that couldn't be verified because his dad was dead at that point. You are under the arrest for the murder of Mandy Stafford. The arrest occurred on December 12th, 2017. I filed charges, charged him with murder in the first degree. Shortly after Mr. Bass was arrested, I drove out to Mary Stavick's home. He said, we've got him. I said, who? <laughs> I, I mean, I did. I was thinking for 15 years, uh, waiting for the day when we could deliver that message, hoping that Mary would still be with us to be able to give the message to her. It was her 81st birthday that day. It was. It was on my birthday that he knocked on my door. Kind of nice birthday present. She was overcome with uh, emotion, and I think we all were. I was shocked. I mean, we, Mandy and I had ridden our bikes past their house, and it just never occurred to us to be worried about who was in their house. Never. I don't want to jeopardize an ongoing investigation or prosecution. We ultimately arranged a press conference. Yes. We had all the detectives uh, that were currently involved in the case and stand at the podium, and we delivered the news to the local media. We hope that this arrest will help bring closure to Mandy's family and the greater Whatcom County community. I was naive in thinking that, you know, my part in this is going to not be known. I just kept waiting for my face to come out. I thought, oh my God, someone's going to find me. And guess what? They found me. Here you are. I wanted so badly to know who it was that did, did that and could meet you. Bless her heart, she said, you know, she said, I did it for you. Oh, I did it for you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. The person I've wanted to meet for a long time is Mary. All of it. I mean, I would do it again for her. A woman I never even knew. While we were interviewing Tim, Gina came in and was being interviewed. Gina did give Tim an alibi. I was on my way to Tim's, and I, I passed her. The new statement you made may be used at trial against you. To me, a trial is a report that we want to be in. I could hardly wait until we began. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the jury. Tim Bass is not guilty. Is it difficult for you to be here testifying today? Very much so. And he said, you know, I was hoping that you could maybe say that you slept with her, too. such a relief to me. The evidence will show that Mandy was abducted and then we can tell you where it happened. My theory is, is Mandy set out to do her five mile run with the dog about a quarter of a mile from her house where there's a wooded area. It's very secluded and uh, 
that's where Tim was waiting for her to run by. He grabs her, gets her in the car. She was taken approximately six miles south to an isolated location where she was raped. I think she tried to get away by running away naked, wearing only her shoes and socks. He caught up with her and hit her in the head and knocked her out. Either struck in the head or pushed into a tree, and then she was placed in the river where she was drowned. The defendant's DNA was inside her, and uh, we know that she was kidnapped, she was raped, and then she was killed. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the jury. Tim Bass is not guilty. He didn't kidnap anyone, he didn't rape anyone, he certainly didn't kill anyone. Evidence of sexual contact is certainly not evidence of murder. Timothy Bass's defense attorneys were trying to say that just because his DNA matched that found in Mandy's body, it doesn't necessarily mean that he killed her. Day two of the Timothy Bass murder trial, Mandy Stavick's mother took the stand 30 years after her teenage daughter was found dead. She was here every day of the trial, and she wanted to know what happened to her daughter. As painful as it was, she wanted the answers. Good morning, Ms. Stavick. Good morning. Good morning. Mary's 82, and the judge said, the jury is going to come in, everybody's going to stand, but you don't have to. You can remain seated while that happens, all right? I can stand. You're, you're going to be okay? I'm fine. Okay, whatever you feel comfortable doing. Well, if everybody else is standing up, I think I'll stand up too. Madam Bailiff? Mary said, I'm going to stand. And she did. The sheriff came to my door and said that they'd found her body. Everybody tells me I did really well. Ms. Stavick, I have just a few questions. I decided that before I went up there that I would answer every question they asked as briefly and as well as I could. Did you ever see her with Tim Bass? No. One of the things I did with the witnesses I called, I asked each of them if they had ever seen Mandy with Tim Bass. No. We wouldn't hang out with them at all, ever. The main point was they didn't know each other, they didn't hang out together, they didn't run in the same circles. Mr. McEachern, would you like to call your next witness? The most devastating testimony against Tim Bass came from Tom Bass, his younger brother. Good afternoon, Mr. Bass. Tim's brother, Tom, who is a few years younger than Tim, testified against him. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in all matters here before the court? Tom is a solid person. Is it difficult for you to be here testifying today? Very much so. When I met with Tom, Tom said, well, he did come up and want me to lie about it, and I told him no. Exhibit 65. When investigators came to Timothy Bass to question him and to ask him to submit a DNA sample, he immediately went to his younger brother, Tom, and said, Tom, they're after me. He was very nervous, very anxious, and he said, the reason I'm so worried, I'm so anxious, is that I slept with Mandy. I said, what? He goes, yeah, I, I slept with Mandy. And he said, you know, I was hoping that you could maybe say that you slept with her too. He said, look, if you could say you had sex with her, that would help to try to make her look like a loose girl. I said, how long did, you know, how long did this go on? He said, oh, I, we slept together a couple times before she went to college and then once when she came back on Thanksgiving break. He asked his brother, do you, do you believe me? And his brother was shocked, at the, just shocked at this. Tom must have realized right then and there that something terrible was going on. He testified at the trial, and, oh, this ain't good. He's asking people to lie for him. Thank you, Tom. I have no further questions, sir. I can't imagine going against my brothers. I mean, it's the heart of what, loyalty, right? It's band of brothers. People understand and appreciate that a brother is not going to flip on another brother unless they truly believe that their brother is guilty of doing something horrible. The state would next call Gina Malone. Were you previously married to the defendant, Tim Bass? Yes. I filed for divorce. I only saw him one time in jail. By the time Gina Bass walked into that courtroom, there's a lot of change in her life. Gina came forward and said that her alibi that she originally told us was false. 
I believe Gina was providing his alibi to protect herself. And when she felt secure and safe herself, then she could actually tell the truth. After the police came, he told me that I need to lie and say that I was with him that day. And he said, otherwise I'm gonna go to prison. I felt like I just have to agree with everything he's saying, because if I don't, I could be next. Do you have any memory of being at the mass house the day after Thanksgiving at all? No. I wasn't a strong person back then. I just was very weak. But I should have gone with my gut instinct. All of today was taken up by these closing arguments. Just a few hours ago, the defense wrapped up this afternoon. This is an investigation that was set up for 30 years based on the faulty assumption that this is a sexual assault. And that is the fundamental error in this case. They could not refute the fact that the DNA found on Mandy's body belonged to their client, Tim Bass. There was no denying that. So they had to say, look, it was consensual relationship. They were trying to tell the jury that they very well could have ignored or excluded the real killer. Everyone in Whatcom County was calling in to say, I saw somebody acting strange. You need to go talk to this guy. All of those suspects were excluded based purely and simply on the fact that their biological evidence did not match the semen that was taken from the stem. I found their theory and their statement a little insulting. Not a little, a lot insulting for the fact that we had it all wrong. We take a lot of pride in our work. I was so eager to get back up and respond to it. I could hardly wait. They would have you believe that somehow there was some she snuck out of the house and had some sexual liaison with this guy. Do you believe that? Do you believe that that can happen? When we bring cases in, we don't expect people to leave their common sense in their cars. How did the DNA get into Andy Stafford from this defendant? And the only explanation was when he raped her after he abducted her and then he killed her. The defendant's DNA was there, and I'm asking you to hold him accountable. The arguments just finished in the trial of a 30-year-old murder case in Whatcom County. The jury will decide whether or not Timothy Bass raped and killed 18-year-old Mandy Stavick. When the jury leaves, I always feel uh, apprehension that you never know. It's almost waiting for a lab test to see if you have cancer or not. I understand the jury has reached its verdict. When they read the verdict, I felt like somebody knocked the wind out of me.
Melody was special. She really was. I don't know why she was, or how she got to be the way she was, just the way she was. I go back to the lyrics of our, of the song, and in our hearts you'll always be a very special memory, Mandy. And that is true. It was true then, and it's true now. And that's the way it was community-wide with all of us. It will keep going. That's a legacy. Mandy will always live on. I kind of learned that the living have to go on to honor the goodness and what you've lost. You know, it's just heartbreaking that mother waited so long for closure, and we are just grateful that she has it tonight. We certainly are, and it is worth noting that Tim Bass's sentence, just under 27 years, is three years less than it took to find justice. And his legal team says they plan to appeal. That is 2020 for tonight. I'm David Muir. And I'm Amy Robach. For all of us here at 2020 and ABC News, good night.